Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the February 14th version of Cardiac Sciences Grand Rounds, and happy Valentine's Day to everyone. Today, we have Dr. Juan Russell. Uh, he is visiting us from the University of Ottawa Heart Institute, where he is one of their uh, interventionalist team, team members. Uh, Dr. Russell uh, did his training in Toronto and was it Columbia in New York? Uh, and uh, and McMaster University, that's right. Uh, and has been several years now at the Ottawa Heart Institute. Uh, he comes to give us a presentation on complex high-risk indi indicated interventions, and we look uh, at the end. There will be some questions, and for people online, if you'd like to enter uh, words and uh, questions into the chat, that would be great. And I, uh, I appreciate the attendance. Either Chip is really popular in Calgary, or emails were sent out. Well, whatever the reason, uh, I appreciate the gesture. Um, so I have no relevant conflicts uh, of interest to disclose. Uh, and I wanted to sit, set out an agenda for the presentation. So I wanted to discuss what is a complex higher risk indicated intervention, uh, discuss and debate uh, the risk treatment paradox, and then share some uh, chip cases that maybe could spark some uh, debate. Uh, hopefully the question period would be interactive because I know that this is a new field. Uh, and it can split uh, people in terms of indication and risk. Uh, so I look forward to conversations. So I started uh, planning the uh, presentation by reflecting on how I ended up uh, in the CHIP field. Uh, and it probably started when I was an internal medicine resident in Toronto. Uh, there was a 30 something year old female that came to the emergency department uh, with an undifferentiated condition. And then while in triage, she developed a cardiac arrest uh, and in the midst of resuscitation, uh, she had an echocardiogram showing ventricular standstill. And the decision was made to cannulate the patient on uh, VA ECMO. Um, the decision was somewhat novel uh, at the time, eCPR wasn't a thing. Uh, but ultimately, after a protracted uh, course in hospital, uh, the patient's ventricular function recovered and she was able to be discharged. And that sort of uh, uh, exposure uh, inspired in me a sense of wonder uh, related to cardiac critical care and kind of informed my decisions uh, moving forward uh, in the field of cardiology. So I decided to pursue a career in cardiac critical care, uh, and I felt that interventional cardiology uh, was an important component uh, based on the fact that most people that come to the CCU still come in because of severe coronary artery disease. Uh, and at the end of my interventional training uh, in Ottawa, I wanted further exposure to ECMO. And I heard about this program in New York uh, that was championing CHIP training um, and that would give me ample exposure to ECMO, but also MCS in general. So I applied to this program and was very eager and happy uh, when I got accepted. Um, and then after the acceptance, uh, I started uh, wondering how prepared I was for this new experience in New York. Uh, thankfully, in my interventional program in Ottawa, uh, there was a lot of PCI volume, lots of STEMI. Uh, so I came in uh, with at least some confidence that I'd had a good exposure to what PCI was. Uh, I read the paper on CHIP uh, by Ajay Kirtani uh, multiple times. It's a very dense but very good paper. Every line seems to have a significant amount of thought. Uh, and then I browsed through the CTO uh, manual by Manos Brilakis. Uh, so I arrived in uh, Washington Heights, uh, the Columbia University Medical Center, uh, ready to be uh, trained on how to perform uh, CHIP procedures. And it wasn't long before I scrubbed in for the first time with Dimitri Kompeliotis, who I consider a mentor and taught me most of what I know about CHIP. Uh, but it immediately became clear to me that most of the procedures that I was uh, facile in uh, were procedures that Dimitri uh, didn't do. Uh, and the procedures that Dimitri did do were procedures that I had never performed. Uh, so I immediately upon arriving to Columbia, I uh, realized how much I did not know about complex uh, interventions and entered a pretty steep uh, and a little bit of an intimidating learning curve as I worked towards uh, trying to uh, please Dimitri, which I can tell you he expected excellence from his fellows. <laughs> and he, he usually wasn't smiling like this uh, when we were together. together. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what is a complex uh, higher risk indicated intervention? So one of the things that's debated is we still don't have a definition, uh, but uh, even though CHIP has come into the interventional landscape within the last 10 years, uh, 
uh, complex high-risk interventional procedures have been performed for decades uh, since the first uh, PCI uh, were performed. Most people feel that they know a CHIP procedure when they see it. So the procedure on the left uh, is not a CHIP procedure, depending on the patient characteristics. Uh, the procedure on the right, uh, based on the fact that the patient has had bypass in the past and seems to require a complex intervention, would be considered a CHIP procedure. So if we know it when we see it, does a definition of CHIP actually matter? Uh, you know, does it matter to hospitals? Does it matter to practitioners? Does it even matter to patients? So I wanted to start uh, uh, this by giving you a, a story as to how CHIP uh, came to be a thing, at least uh, in the US, where a lot of the CHIP interventions, I feel at present, are being championed. So in 2007, the results of COURAGE uh, came out. Uh, and COURAGE was a pivotal trial because it showed that uh, PCI compared to medical therapy uh, wasn't superior in preventing death or myocardial infarction in patients with stable coronary artery disease. Um, now, this was expected uh, through knowledge translation to lead to a significant change in practice. Uh, but there was a study in JAMA in 2011 uh, showing that some of the lessons of the COURAGE trial had not necessarily uh, trickled into clinical practice. Uh, so the use of optimal medical therapy, which they would have defined as an antiplatelet, uh, statin, uh, and uh, beta blocker, unless there were contraindications, was actually not practiced in the majority of the patients. So you see to the left, uh, the use of medical, optimal medical therapy before PCI, both before and after COURAGE, and you see that it's between 40 to 50%. And then after PCI, uh, increases only slightly to just above uh, 60%. Uh, before and after courage. And this uh, study got a lot of attention uh, in the media. Uh, many people felt that this was uh, evidence that PCI was overused, uh, and they started commenting uh, or wondering for what reasons, you know, were physicians performing PCI unnecessarily uh, in the U.S.? And if so, what was the driving force uh, behind that use? But the truth was that the elective uh, PCI uh, rates were actually already going down before COURAGE. So this is a, a study published by Robert Ye uh, in JAMA uh, Internal Medicine in 2015, analyzing the rates of PCI in Massachusetts. Uh, so you see that the, the rates of elective PCI on the left were steadily going down year after year uh, with a stronger inflection point at around 2007 when the results of COURAGE uh, were published. And then after that, they stabilized again, but continued on a downtrend. Uh, this is um, uh, in comparison to the PCI's uh, uh, rates for MI, which remain relatively stable. Uh, and on the right, you see revascularization with bypass, which was also uh, decreasing for elective patients, uh, but you don't see that same inflection point in 2007, um, mainly because uh, COURAGE wasn't a trial of cabbage, it was a trial of PCI. Now, another thing that occurred uh, during that time is that states uh, started adopting the voluntary public reporting uh, program. And this was felt to be a very important initiative uh, because everyone wanted uh, evidence-based care. So they wanted procedures that were shown to improve clinical outcomes, and they wanted them at the lowest cost, delivered safely, and with transparency. And there was a number of important stakeholders uh, that they recognized uh, that were to be involved in this process. So one were the payers, whether it was patients, insurance companies or governments. Uh, the second were patients themselves who obviously wanted uh, better outcomes at the lowest price. And then policymakers uh, and politicians who obviously provide uh, a lot of the funding for healthcare. And then the last stakeholder group were physicians. And physicians, if you notice, are circled with a cloud as opposed to uh, just a regular circle. Uh, because the authors recognized that physicians had mixed feelings about what uh, the effect of public reporting would be, whether it would be positive or negative. Uh, and we'll discuss that in more detail. So this is a study that was published in Jack in 2005, uh, comparing uh, the mortality rates of people uh, undergoing uh, admissions uh, with PCI uh, in hospitals in New York and Michigan. So the difference between New York and Michigan was that New York was an early adopter of uh, voluntary outcome uh, reporting, uh, and Michigan was not. Uh, and as first sight, you can see here that when you look at the mortality rates in hospitals in New York, uh, they're a lot lower uh, than they were in Michigan. 
Uh, so at first stroke, without further analysis, you would assume that that is a success of public reporting. Uh, but it is important to know why things are, and then um, you know, uh, analyze in more detail why this was the case, uh, uh, that there was a difference between reporting and non-reporting states. Uh, so one of the things that they noticed is if you came in with MI complicated by cardiac shock, you were way less likely to undergo PCI. And this would have been an indicated procedure if you were in a reporting state uh, uh, compared to a non-reporting state, suggesting that maybe physicians were uh, avoiding risk uh, when this avoidance was not necessarily warranted. Uh, so one of the questions you might ask is, what effect does this have on clinical outcomes in general? So again, uh, Robert Ye, who's interested in this uh, topic, published a paper in Jack in 2015, uh, showing the uh, mortality, the odds ratios of mortality, depending on whether you underwent PCI in a reporting or non-reporting state. Uh, so if you actually look at patients who underwent PCI, you're less likely to die if you underwent PCI uh, in a reporting state. But if you actually did not undergo PCI, uh, you were actually more likely to die uh, in a reporting state. So uh, mortality was lower for PCI performed in reporting states, uh, and it was higher for patients who came in with myocardial infarction who were not treated with PCI in reporting states. So which patients were being avoided? Um, if you look at the main uh, risk factors for avoiding PCI in reporting states, you will see that patients who are older, uh, greater or equal to the age of 65, patients uh, with Medicare insurance, patients with STEMI, and patients presenting with cardiac arrest or cardiac shock were less likely to undergo PCI uh, in reporting states. So what effect does this patient uh, selection have on mortality? Well, if you look at all-cause mortality in patients with myocardial infarction, you find that you're more likely to die if you come into a hospital, uh, which is in a reporting state. Uh, and the odds ratios are uh, quite high. So 1.2 uh, is the odds ratio of dying in a reporting state uh, compared to a non-reporting state. Uh, and again, this is based uh, presumably on uh, patient selection. Now you might say uh, this is Canada and that is the US, but a similar trend uh, has been noted in Canada. So. Uh, there are a number of large registries in Canada, so ACS1, ACS2, and the GRACE registry. So this is a paper published in 2008 showing mortality rates in patients coming with non-ST segment elevation, ACS, um, in relation to TIMI risk score. Uh, and as you can see, as would be predicted, that patients with a higher uh, TIMI risk score are more likely to die when they come into hospital with a myocardial infarction. Now, around the same time, there are a number of trials suggesting that early coronary angiography in patients presenting with non-ST segment elevation ACS uh, and high-risk features was clinically indicated, one of the trials being tactics. Uh, and the rates of coronary angiography were still low uh, in Canada. And people started looking as to reasons why patients were not being referred for coronary angiography. So when we actually surveyed physicians, most physicians said that the reason why they weren't referring patients for coronary angiography was because uh, patients were not high risk enough or because the clinical trial evidence did not support uh, the use of this intervention. However, if you then actually looked at the patients who were referred uh, for coronary angiography and compare them to those who weren't, you see that patients who were not referred for coronary angiography were older. Uh, they were more likely to be female. They're more likely to have a previous history of bypass, stroke, or TIA, or CHF. They're more likely to have a killer class greater than one, and they're more likely to have a higher uh, creatinine. And these are all high-risk features. So it seems like patients were actually selected against uh, when they had high risk. And in fact, if you actually look at the TIMI risk scores of patients who were not referred for coronary angiography, you'd find that 59% of them had a TIMI risk score of uh, three or greater, uh, consistent with intermediate to high risk, uh, and that 70% uh, of them had a GRACE risk score uh, greater or equal to 109, uh, consistent again with intermediate to high risk. Uh, and it's not only that the risk was missed uh, in patients who were not sent for coronary angiography, but patients, again, were selected against based on uh, their risk. Uh, so this is a study by uh, Andrew Yan published in 2007, again, looking at the ACS 1 and 2 registries, showing that you are less likely to be referred for coronary angiography when coming in with a non-ST segment elevation ACS if you had a higher GRACE risk score. Uh, 
which again would have been uh, practicing uh, basically against uh, the evidence. And again, this is when we talk about baseline uh, risk, which is a great risk score. We're not talking about the risk of the procedure itself, but the risk of having a bad outcome uh, upon presentation uh, to hospital. In fact, if you actually look at the negative predictors for referral for coronary angiography, you find that GRACE risk score is the strongest negative predictor of referral for coronary angiography uh, with an uh, uh, adjusted odds ratio of 0.35 and a p-value being very statistically significant. Uh, another negative predictor was being female. And then positive predictors of referral for coronary angiography were uh, being admitted to a hospital that had a cath lab and then being admitted under the uh, care of a cardiologist as opposed to other specialties. So what is a higher risk uh, indicated intervention? So we had a discussion about chat GPT yesterday and as part of the preparation uh, for the lecture, uh, I asked uh, AI in its wisdom to give me a succinct uh, definition of what uh, complex higher risk indicated uh, procedure was. Uh, so uh, AI told me that CHIP is complex because it requires advanced technical skills uh, to perform the procedure safely. Uh, it is high risk because it is associated with high rates of death, uh, stroke, or myocardial infarction. It is indicated because conservative treatments have failed to achieve the desired outcome. And then CHIP uh, gave me two examples, uh, or AI gave me two examples of CHIP. Uh, one is PCI requiring rotational atherectomy, which most of... Uh, uh, interventions were required as uh, having some components of CHIP. And then the other interesting answer was cabbage, uh, which is not uh, traditionally considered uh, CHIP, but I don't know who's right, whether humans or AI uh, knows best. Uh, so, you know, we'll see. Now, uh, Ajay Kirtani felt that it was very important to define what the CHIP population was because uh, he felt that he needed to develop a program uh, where people would uh, achieve both uh, cognitive and technical skills uh, to perform these procedures safely. And he basically uh, identified three tenets of what a CHIP patient uh, uh, is made of. So one is patient comorbidities. Um, the second one is adverse hemodynamics or depressed left ventricular systolic function. Uh, and then the last uh, tenet is the complexity of the coronary anatomy. And we'll go through uh, each of them uh, briefly. So when it comes to patient comorbidities, there's a number of factors uh, that affect the risk of bypass more so than they do uh, PCI. So one of them is obstructive airway disease, particular patients who are uh, on home oxygen, uh, severe liver disease, carotid artery disease or prior stroke, uh, frailty, uh, prior cabbage, a hostile chest, and a severe aortic calcification or porcelain uh, aorta. And then there are other risk factors that actually disproportionately affect uh, PCI uh, compared to cabbage. This would be an unprotected left main, complex bifurcation or trifurcation lesions, uh, the presence of CTOs, heavily calcified lesions, a high syntax score, uh, among others. And then the last uh, or the, the second component is adverse hemodynamics, which in general is felt to affect cabbage uh, disproportionately to PCI mainly because of the stress of the body, uh, whether you do the procedure on pump or off pump, uh, even though this is subject uh, to debate. Uh, so adverse hemodynamics, impaired left ventricular, right ventricular function, uh, pulmonary hypertension, valvular heart disease are things that uh, generally would increase the risk uh, when a patient's undergoing uh, cabbage and could potentially based on AI, uh, uh, define cabbage as a form of CHIP. And then the last component is the complexity of the coronary anatomy. Um, so at the bottom, we have your uh, type A lesion. Uh, as you move up in complexity, you have uh, bifurcation lesions. Uh, you move up in complexity, you have bifurcation lesions involving the left main. Uh, and then as you reach the, the pinnacle of complexity, you have uh, procedures that require significant calcium modification when they involve the left main, uh, and then CTO at the top. And again, CTO being a continuum, uh, ranging from anti-grade uh, wire escalation at the bottom of complexity to anti-grade dissection re-entry to retrograde dissection re-entry techniques. Because of the higher risk uh, of these uh, procedures and because of the complexity, uh, Ija Katani came uh, with a list of some of the skills that you needed to be uh, exposed to before tackling some of these procedures safely. Uh, so when I was uh, doing my CHIP fellowship, a lot of it revolved around doing CTOs. 
Uh, and again, uh, I could tell you uh, it was an eye-opening experience on the first day. I didn't even know where the wires were uh, when it came to the vasculature. So it kind of motivated me uh, to read more. Um, and even though I had come in mostly uh, to get training on hemodynamic support, that's what I truly wanted. One of the things I appreciated the most uh, was the exposure that I had to complication management. Uh, because a lot of these, uh, and I'll discuss later on, a lot of these procedures are associated with a higher rate of adverse events. In fact, there was a paper uh, published last year in Jack Interventions uh, that tried to provide a numerical definition of CHIP. Uh, so using the BSIS database in the UK, which had uh, more than 300,000 patients, they ran a regression analysis to identify uh, patient and procedural factors that were associated with higher rates of MACE. So those would be death, uh, stroke, and myocardial infarction. And they found seven patient factors. So uh, being uh, uh, older, so greater or equal to 80 years, uh, being female, uh, having a prior stroke or MI, having peripheral arterial disease, an ejection fraction of less than 30, or chronic kidney disease were patient risk factors that were associated uh, with a higher risk of complications uh, during PCI. And then when you look at procedural factors, some of the uh, factors that made it was left main PCI, three vessel PCI, procedures requiring dual arterial access, uh, PCI performed with mechanical circuitry support, uh, PCI and lesions that were longer than 60 millimeters, and then procedures requiring rotational atherectomy. Again, this is probably before uh, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, spreading use of IVL. Uh, and as you can see that as you go from a CHIP score of zero to 13, your risk of having a complication during the procedure uh, grow or rise exponentially. Uh, and the authors in this uh, paper arbitrarily picked a CHIP score of five uh, as a proposed uh, definition of CHIP because after a CHIP score of five, the rates of adverse events uh, following PCI would go up more than 5%. Uh, which uh, at one point would make you uh, think more clearly about both the indications of the procedure and then the technical skills that are required to perform such a procedure safely. But one of the most important questions in CHIP is, uh, are these procedures actually indicated? So one of the most important trials of uh, 2022 and maybe the most important trial in CHIP so far is the Revive uh, BSIS-2 trial that was uh, published last year uh, and uh, presented at ESC. Uh, so that trial came as a result of stitches. As you'll recall, uh, in the stitch trial, uh, there was no significant uh, uh, reduction uh, in the primary endpoint in patients uh, randomized to bypass compared to medical therapy, but uh, the curves did diverge after two years. Uh, and part of the reason why uh, it was felt that the uh, primary outcome was not met was that bypass was associated with high risk of complications during the immediate perioperative period. Um, and therefore you needed to actually wait longer for patients to accrue the benefits of bypass. And that's why the stitch uh, extension study uh, ended up being positive and not the stitch study itself. So one of the questions that Pereira et al. asked uh, in the BSIS study was, can we allow patients to gain this benefit from revascularization uh, that they seem to gain with bypass uh, in the stitches trial? without necessarily subjecting them to that early first hit uh, that patients with bypass uh, can undergo. So they actually uh, opted to randomize 700 patients uh, and the uh, inclusion criteria were having an ejection fraction of less than or equal to 35%, uh, extensive CAD, and this was uh, defined as a BSIS jeopardy score of greater or equal to six, uh, significant viability, uh, defined as viability in uh, four or more uh, myocardial segments that could be revascularized with PCI. Uh, and then if you met all of these criteria and you had not had an MI in the last four weeks or an admission for decompensated heart failure or an arrhythmia in the last 72 hours, you're randomized to either optimal medical therapy or PCI uh, with optimal medical therapy. Uh, and the primary outcome was all cause death or admission for heart failure uh, with a minimum follow-up of two years. And as you can see here, uh, these are the results of the Revive 2. So the Kaplan-Meier curves are completely superimposed uh, onto one another. And even though their hypothesis was right, you don't see that early hit uh, in risk that you see with bypass. Unfortunately, the curves didn't actually diverge uh, as they did uh, in patients who were randomized uh, to stitch 
and then followed up with stitches. So essentially for this patient population, it seemed like uh, high risk uh, multi-vessel PCI uh, wasn't associated with a reduction in heart outcomes. Uh, with that said, there seemed to be an improvement in quality of life. Uh, but again, the main question is, do procedures in this patient population uh, uh, lead to longevity or at least decrease uh, heart failure hospitalizations? So very appropriately, uh, the editorial uh, for the uh, revived uh, uh, BSIS-2 trial was written by Ajay Katani, and this is a very good editorial. Uh, Ajay Katani recognized that this was a very well uh, design randomized control trial, but that whenever we look at evidence-based medicine, that details uh, do really matter. So what are some of the details that are important uh, when you're actually analyzing Revive? And this is uh, important because even though the abstract would tell you that these procedures uh, don't uh, improve longevity, you still want to know what's best for the patient that is sitting uh, in your office or in the cath lab table. So one of the things uh, that is relevant about Revive is that only 26% uh, percent of patients that were screened were randomized. Uh, and Dr. Pereira gave very good interviews as to uh, what happened to the other 75%. Uh, so a significant portion of the remaining patients were sent for PCI because they were symptomatic. Uh, so if you're symptomatic and you had uh, left ventricular systolic dysfunction, you already had an indication for revascularization if you're on optimal medical therapy. Uh, with the intent of reduced symptoms. The other elephant in the room is that at the time of revive, uh, the results of stitches and, uh, were uh, out uh, at some point uh, during the randomization. So you could argue, well, uh, why were these patients randomized to a trial comparing medical therapy to PCI when they already had an indication for an intervention? Is that ethical? And there's a number of uh, uh, interesting uh, anecdotes on uh, risk adverse behaviors that Dr. Pereira gives. Uh, but this trial uh, essentially randomized patients who were not symptomatic, did not have angina. Uh, there's a lot of debate as to if you don't have angina, do you have ischemia? You know, if, if, when myocardium is now hibernating, uh, do those patients actually not experience symptoms? But the ischemia results of the Revive 2, uh, the Revive BSIS 2 are yet to be published. Uh, patients had little to no heart failure symptoms. Uh, most viability testing was done with cardiac MRI, uh, and ischemia testing was not needed to be enrolled in the study. And then the median left ventricular ejection fraction uh, by core lab was about uh, 32%, so close to the 35% threshold. And then the uh, most important question is, in order to have a uh, viable myocardium, um, you know, the, the myocardium may or may not be ischemic, does ischemia actually matter? So these are, uh, this is a sub-study of the ischemia trial. And as you know, the ischemia trial randomized patients uh, with a significant amount of ischemia uh, to either invasive therapy with PCI or bypass or conservative therapy. So these are the results of ischemia uh, in relation to the left ventricular ejection fraction on admission. And you can see that as the left ventricular ejection fraction becomes uh, uh, less and less or so more abnormal, uh, the curves between a conservative and invasive uh, treatment split. Uh, and favor an invasive treatment. And again, most of the patients in ischemia uh, were treated with PCI. You'll see that there's a cutoff of 35% in the ejection fraction because 35% was an exclusion uh, criteria uh, for the ischemia trial. So I, I do believe that the REVIVE uh, BCS2 trial is practice changing. Uh, and Dr. Pereira actually uh, stated the patient population for whom uh, it applies. So if you have a patient who has a depressed ejection fraction uh, less than or equal to 35%, uh, who is completely stable, minimally symptomatic, uh, and reporting no heart failure symptoms on optimal medical therapy, then you should not sell PCI as a way of improving uh, longevity. Uh, but then again, if you have a patient who perhaps is younger, has a significant amount of ischemia, is very symptomatic, uh, the jury is still out as to whether you should revascularize those patients. And uh, uh, if you take the advice of the PI of this study, uh, when he was debating the results of the ESC, he would say that these patients would be patients for whom he would still uh, refer for revascularization, both for symptomatic uh, reasons and also clinical acropoise uh, when it comes to heart outcomes. Uh, and this is very common in evidence-based medicine. Like uh, evidence-based medicine uh, is the way we practice now. 
maybe we'll be transitioning to personalized medicine. But whenever we look at the randomized control trial and the primary analysis, we get a mean treatment difference. And that mean treatment difference is composed of a number of patients. Some of them may have benefited from the intervention. Some of them may have been unaffected by the intervention. And some of them may have been harmed. And a lot of the time, risk stratification helps you dictate how your patient will respond to a given intervention. So I'll give you a number of examples on uh, landmark trials uh, in a couple of slides. And this is extremely important because ultimately I want to do what's best for my patients. So I most definitely want to avoid PCI when it's not indicated. If patients don't stand anything to gain, you're only exposing them to risk. Uh, but at the same time, I don't want to make errors of omission by not performing PCI due to an undue uh, risk aversity that was seen potentially in reporting states where patients are more likely to die uh, if they don't have uh, the intervention. I'll give you a number of examples. Uh, so this is the Keeley meta-analysis uh, that was published in 2003. And this was the first time that primary PCI, which is uh, the main indication for PCI uh, that exists in 2023, was shown to have a mortality benefit. Uh, each single trial uh, that composed this uh, 23 study uh, meta-analysis did not actually reach the power to show mortality. Now, in the red box, you'll see a trial by Anderson et al. So this is the DANAMI uh, 2 trial, which is the largest trial uh, in this meta-analysis. And this trial was published in 2003, uh, just shortly before uh, this meta-analysis was published. And this uh, trial showed that if you randomize patients uh, to either fibrinolysis or primary PCI, you can actually reduce the composite endpoint of death, clinical reinfarction, or disabling stroke at 30 days uh, by using uh, primary PCI as opposed to fibrinolysis. Now, one of the most uh, innovative uh, parts of the dynamic two trial it was, it was the first trial that actually randomized patients to primary PCI uh, when they presented to a referral hospital rather than to a PCI capable hospital. And this was quite relevant. This is why we transfer patients for primary PCI for other hospitals. Um, and you can see here that uh, the difference is still uh, pronounced uh, with most patients in Nanami 2 uh, having presented to referral hospitals. Now, uh, again, Nanami 2 did not show mortality uh, uh, in the main uh, group. But if you actually stratify the population in Nanami 2 based on Timmy risk score, you find that in patients who have uh, the highest risk, so this is Timmy uh, risk score of uh, five or greater, you could actually already see a mortality benefit. So 36% mortality uh, if you were treated with fibrinolysis compared to 25% mortality with primary PCI. Uh, and the p-value was 0 0.02. Uh, when you actually look at uh, mortality uh, for patients with uh, Timmy risk score of zero to four, you actually find um, you know, a non-significant uh, uh, association between the treatment uh, and risk, uh, but you see that the curves actually trend in the opposite direction. So the uh, mortality was 8% with primary PCI compared to 6% uh, with fibrinolysis with a p-value that wasn't significant. And then the p interaction being very statistically significant at 0 0.008. You know, this is interesting because uh, in, in our, my, our, my practice in Ottawa, we have a catchment area that's uh, like basically hospitals are assigned either a pharmaco-invasive strategy or a primary PCI strategy. Uh, and the initial uh, threshold was about expected 60 minutes of transfer time. And then it started creeping up uh, to the two hour uh, interval that was seen in dynamic. Uh, but a lot of the patients actually fall uh, within the 90 minute to 120 minute interval. So a lot of the times uh, we'll get calls in the middle of the night from a resident saying, I have a patient uh, that comes in with a STEMI. These are the characteristics. Should I lice or should I send for primary PCI? I would say if you ask, if you poll most people, most people will say they're more likely to lice a high-risk patient uh, due to the concern about uh, them uh, continuing to be ischemic on transfer. Whereas if you actually look at the DINAMI trial, which is the biggest trial examining this approach, it would tell you that maybe you should do the opposite. Maybe those high-risk patients uh, that come in and that uh, don't have a readily available uh, PCI uh, lab available like uh, within 90 to 120 minutes, maybe those are the patients that should actually be transferred rather than uh, lysed on the spot. Again, this is uh, hypothesis generating uh, because it's a sub-study of a randomized control trial. Uh, 
the other uh, study is a Canadian study, uh, which actually shows a uh, similar lesson. So this is a transfer AMI uh, trial, uh, one of the largest trials uh, looking at what happens when patients present to a non-PCI capable hospital where primary PCI is not available in a timely manner. What do you do with these patients? Do you leave them at that hospital and transfer them only if they need rescue uh, PCI for failed revascularization, or do you transfer them preemptively for early uh, coronary angiography? And this was, uh, a, again, a Canadian trial published in 2009. And this trial showed that if you actually transfer patients for routine early PCI after terminal lysis, again, in a setting where timely primary PCI is not available, that you can reduce uh, the rates of death, uh, reinfarction, worsening heart failure, cardiac shock uh, at 30 days uh, with um, a strategy of uh, pharmacoinvasive uh, approach. Now, uh, Andrew Yan uh, published a study in 2007, again, using risk stratification to find out how does risk modulate the treatment effect of a pharmacoinvasive strategy. And the results were actually quite shocking and did not really match uh, those of the NAMI-2. Again, those being two completely different trials. The NAMI-2 being a trial of primary PCI where timely primary PCI was available. And then transfer AMI being a trial of a pharmacoinvasive strategy after femolysis provided in a setting where timely primary PCI was not available. Uh, and they found that actually uh, in patients with a low to intermediate risk risk score, a pharmacoinvasive strategy was actually beneficial when it came to death or MI at 30 days. But in patients with high risk, uh, the result was the inverse. So patients with high risk were more likely uh, to be harmed by a pharmacoinvasive strategy. Uh, and the actual uh, uh, association is true for mortality at 30 days. Again, an inverse that if you're at higher grace risk score, you're less likely to derive a benefit uh, from a pharmacoinvasive strategy, potentially even be harmed. Again, hypothesis generating, but it makes you question whenever you have a patient that's lies on the field and somebody asks you, should I transfer this patient or they arrive to hospital and you're deciding whether you should cast them right away or whether you should, you can delay the cast and continue the list. A lot of the time you're gonna choose to cast patients who are at higher risk to begin with uh, and the risk stratification shown on transfer AMI would say that maybe you should do the opposite, right? Because there are risks of undergoing early PCI, platelet activation, et cetera, after terminal lysis. Uh, so this is relevant. This is again showing you the heterogeneity and treatment effect showing that risk modulates uh, the efficacy of a pharmacoinvasive strategy and not the way that we would think of uh, intuitively. So as uh, Dr. Kirtani would say, uh, when it comes to evidence-based medicine, details do matter, and experience probably matters uh, too. So I wanted to show you a couple of uh, chip cases. I want to make sure that I, I am still on time. Um, so basically, the first case is a 61-year-old male um, that came in uh, to a peripheral hospital with a non-STEMI. He had an angiogram showing severe uh, triple vessel disease. Uh, and an echocardiogram showing an ejection fraction of 20% and moderate to severe aortic stenosis. Uh, the uh, uh, referring hospital did not have surgical capability, so the patient was transferred uh, to the center uh, in New York for bypass and uh, surgical AVR. Now, while uh, uh, waiting for the procedure, the interventionalists uh, reviewed the angiograms. This is uh, essentially uh, a patient with severe uh, osteal LAD uh, and osteal stroke disease, as well as an occluded RCA uh, with left to right collaterals. So shortly after being admitted uh, and awaiting bypass, uh, the patient actually had a ventricular fibrillation arrest. Uh, and despite multiple attempts at uh, uh, electrical cardioversion, uh, they were unable to achieve uh, ROSC. Uh, and because a VA ECMO uh, team was readily available, uh, the decision was made uh, to cannulate the patient on VA ECMO, uh, both as a form of eCPR, but also to expedite uh, PCI in an urgent matter. So this was uh, the PCI that was performed on that uh, LED and CERC. And as you can see, the heart is not beating uh, because this procedure was done while the patient was still uh, in ventricular fibrillation because the patient cannot be shocked uh, out of the ventricular fibrillation. Uh, 
uh, and this is uh, the results uh, after the procedure. Um, so kind of a relatively straightforward uh, procedure, but high risk uh, based on the patient characteristics and the clinical scenario. Uh, and as you can see here, the heart is now beating because shortly after uh, the left main into LAD and CERC was revascularized, one shock was all it took uh, to get the patient back into sinus rhythm. And this patient survived to hospital discharge. So, uh, you know, uh, say what you will, we're still debating the efficacy of eCPR. And again, eCPR may not be sustainable uh, in a lot of settings, but I don't see this patient having survived uh, any other way. Maybe he was one shock away from going into sinus rhythm, or maybe he would have died uh, and being seen as one of those high-risk patients that we can do nothing about. But just like that early uh, case of a female with myocarditis and ventricular standstill that came into the ER, I really could not see survival uh, in her case through any other approach. The second case is a little bit uh, more controversial, and I think it deals with uh, uh, CHIP uh, and the training for CHIP. So 70-year-old male, multiple previous uh, bypass procedures presenting with CCS3 uh, angina uh, in the context of a CTO of the RCA and an ejection fashion that was preserved, uh, turned down for surgery because most of the arterial grafts uh, veins had been used and uh, the uh, chest was not, uh, deemed to not be amenable uh, to further procedures uh, based on, again, all the previous bypasses that had been done. Uh, so here you see uh, an occluded RCA uh, on the left and on the right, you see an occluded LED and then a CERC uh, that provides collaterals uh, to the RCA uh, epicardially, which is probably the highest uh, risk uh, epicardial that can be used uh, for retrograde uh, CTO PCI. Uh, here you can see on the left another shot of the LED occluded uh, and then the, um, uh, the collateral from the CERC, epicardial collateral providing uh, flow to a relatively large uh, RCA. Uh, and then on the right, you can see uh, kind of a somewhat diseased uh, saponous vein graft to the LED, uh, and then a lead to the LED uh, that anastomosis is uh, more distally, uh, both of them being patent. Um, so uh, the patient did not have any occluded uh, viable saponous vein graft to use as a retrograde approach. Uh, the uh, RCA was severely calcified and tortuous. Uh, and there were no ideal septal collaterals to do this procedure. So this procedure was high risk uh, to begin with. So one of the questions you ask yourself is, uh, is the procedure indicated? You know, if you're living with CCS-free angina uh, and medical therapy has failed, what sort of risk uh, would you accept uh, in order to try to get rid of that angina and maybe lead a better life? Uh, so these are the results of courage. Again, the Kaplan-Meier curves of courage uh, are somewhat similar to those seen uh, in the STITCHES trial, uh, where again, you have a higher risk uh, of complications early on if you undergo an invasive approach, uh, but then the Kaplan-Meier curves uh, cross and then diverge as time goes on. And there's a lot of debate about the rate of spontaneous uh, MI versus uh, periprocedural MIs, uh, but ultimately there was no evidence of any significant benefit. But uh, another uh, uh, finding of um, uh, the ischemia trial is that there was a definite reduction in symptoms in patients that were randomized to an invasive therapy, again, uh, PCI or cabbage uh, compared to medical therapy. And that this is actually proportional, the reduction in symptom to the baseline uh, uh, symptom that the patient has. So based on the Seattle angina questionnaire. So this is what ended up happening in the procedure. Uh, so uh, here you have, uh, this procedure was performed by Dimitri and I was the second operator. Dimitri is trying to get into the subintimal space into this very calcified uh, right coronary artery and having some difficulties uh, doing so because of the degree of calcification. So he proceeds uh, to basically uh, try to advance the procedure by using the epicardial collateral after deeming uh, there to be no septal or saponous vein graft that could provide a retrograde channel. Um, so this is uh, Dimitri being very facile at what he did and understanding the risk of uh, epicardial collaterals, navigates through the epicardial collaterals and gets into the distal uh, RCA. Uh, and then at that point, uh, he's trying to complete uh, the retrograde uh, dissection reentry uh, approach. Uh, 
uh, then he starts uh, running into trouble because of the calcification. So in order to perform uh, anti-grade dissection reentry, uh, sorry, a retrograde dissection reentry, your wires uh, need to be uh, right beside uh, one another uh, in order for you to reenter. But the proximal RCA was so calcified that it was very difficult for him to advance uh, not only the wire, but also the microcatheter with the wire and get into the submintimal space, which is required uh, to complete this procedure. Um, so uh, he tried multiple approaches. He eventually succeeded at getting the retrograde wire a little bit more proximal. Uh, and then started uh, pushing the anti-grade uh, microcatheter uh, to try to get to that retrograde wire uh, and do the procedure. At one point, uh, he seemed to be uh, succeeding, and then all of a sudden, the microcatheter buckled in a very unnatural way. Um, and uh, this is what he had. He had a massive uh, perforation of the RCA uh, in a patient uh, that was, uh, had essentially had bypass three times in the past, uh, and as you know, these uh, effusions are very difficult to tap. Uh, they can be difficult to address uh, surgically, particularly in patients who had previous uh, bypass, uh, and they now become a medical emergency. So Dimitri now is in trouble uh, because he hasn't even crossed uh, uh, the procedure. So he can, the patient can bleed both anti-grade and retrograde. And then the question is, what do you do uh, in this situation? So. One of the things Dimitri did is to try to advance the anti-grade uh, guide, uh, and he deployed a cover stent, uh, papyrus stent. Uh, but then you can see uh, that there's still active uh, dye extravasation uh, into the uh, pericardial space or whatever loculated space uh, that is. Uh, so Dimitri is still in trouble. But given his understanding of complications like this, uh, uh, Dimitri understood that the, the anti-grade wire was in the true lumen, the retrograde wire was in the subintimal space. And when you deploy a stent, you basically create a drum at the distal edge of the stent that then uh, he used to facilitate uh, retrograde entering uh, into the anti-grade wire, into the anti-grade uh, catheter. So this is basically uh, Dimitri using what he defined as a stent-assisted uh, reverse cart. Uh, and, um, oh, I think this is going the opposite way. So this is finally what the uh, procedure uh, looked like. Uh, and I remember uh, we finished this procedure probably at 11 o'clock at night because it was started late. Uh, and I reflected a lot of this uh, procedure as a, as a fellow. I mean, uh, when a patient almost dies on the table, um, you start putting your retrospective uh, glasses and wonder, you know, should this have been done? Like, uh, was the patient uh, symptomatic enough? Uh, were the risks probably understood uh, or were they understood appropriately by the patient? Uh, as the risk in a procedure escalate, you need to take a step back and then rediscuss options with the patient because maybe the amount of risk which can evolve during an intervention uh, increases as the procedure becomes more complicated, right? Because you don't know how complicated a procedure is until you actually start doing it, right? Some procedures might seem straightforward when they're not, and other procedures might be complex and ultimately uh, prove to be straightforward. Um, the part that I was sure about uh, is that this patient would probably have died uh, if the procedure had not been done with someone uh, with the level of training that Dimitri had. Uh, so it's a humbling experience to know that if you're gonna take on these procedures, um, that it should be done with a lot of care. I would tell you, uh, I don't do epicardial collaterals uh, for retrograde PCI. I've never done them. Uh, and many people believe that the threshold should be higher to perform those procedures because if you get a perforation, the risk of mortality are higher. And if, in fact, if you look at CTO registries, most of the mortality is associated with uh, retrograde epicardial collateral use. So whenever you do these procedures, uh, I now ask myself, is the procedure indicated? Can it be performed safely? And then the last question is, can it be performed safely here or by me? Uh, and if the answer is no, uh, you don't embark uh, in this procedure. And since I started as staff in 2019, I have seen Dimitri uh, defend uh, CHIP uh, CTO uh, and you know, PCI in general uh, in social media. And this is a quote from Dimitri on Twitter that really got to me one time that I was you know, debating the indications for uh, CTO intervention. Uh, so it's human nature to consider something unnecessary when one cannot do it. It's as simple as that. 
Uh, I never claimed that CTO should be done in everyone or that all interventionals uh, should be uh, doing CTOs. And he quotes a Michigan study that shows that uh, the complication rates of CTO are proportional uh, to volume uh, with CTO. So what is a complex high-risk intervention? It's a patient-centered initiative. It aims to provide the benefits of revascularization to a potentially underserved population. It also uh, tries to champion training in the cognitive and technical skills required to perform complex high-risk interventions uh, safely and effectively when they're indicated, uh, and also to advance the field uh, through perspective studies. And there's definitely perspective studies uh, that are to come. So both Protect4 and CHIP uh, BSIS3 are uh, well into enrollment, uh, more of an idea as to what it is. And uh, there's also BSIS-4, which is essentially stage three, comparing PCI to cabbage in the same uh, population that was uh, included uh, in Revive-2 uh, or revive BSIS-2. So thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Dr. Russell, for that wonderful talk. That was great. We'll open the floor up to questions. Uh, I'll start off with a question. Uh, do you think there is a role for targeted ischemia testing in these kind of patients? I think, I, yeah. Yeah, so, um, uh, and you mean in the revived BSIS-2? Yeah. I really think there is uh, a role for ischemia testing. Uh, one of the things that has been debated uh, is uh, the whole concept of hibernating uh, myocardium. So by definition, hibernating myocardium is both viable and ischemic. Uh, so one of the things that was surprising about Revive BSIS-2 is that people said, well, is this concept of uh, hibernating myocardium uh, even appropriate? Um, so I would say that when you look at uh, Revive BSIS-2, a lot of the patients uh, were uh, proven to have viability by MRI, and that's just uh, a matter of how the practice is in UK. Uh, an MRI shows you that myocardium is viable, but not necessarily ischemic. Uh, so one of the questions that IJ Kirtani mentioned is, well, if you actually have patients that have, in general, two-vessel disease, right? Uh, could some of these patients have had non-ischemic uh, dilated cardiomyopathies? Um, I really, really, really feel that ischemia testing is important, uh, and that is either non-invasively or through uh, FFR testing. And again, there's a number of sub-studies that we're still waiting uh, for the, the revived BSIS-2. Uh, but one of the most interesting questions this I posed to the audience uh, debate uh, is that um, most patients in revived uh, did not have symptoms. Um, and, you know, by the pathophysiology of uh, ischemia, you would expect that if the myocardium is ischemic, uh, patients would be symptomatic. Uh, and Pereira, in one of the interviews, uh, argued, well, uh, if the myocardium is now hibernating uh, because it's ischemic, uh, can it be just um, uh, adjusted perfectly such that because it's quiescent, uh, patients are not having symptoms? Uh, and this is a matter of debate. Like, uh, can you actually have uh, ischemia without symptoms? I guess you could. Um, I would say if I were to do uh, BSIS-2, uh, uh, um, by the way, I think uh, Dr. Pereira is like a masterful clinical trialist. Like every single interview that I uh, viewed from BSIS-2, because I didn't have the opportunity to go to ESC, like uh, every single step was well uh, thought of but I probably would have required uh, not only viability, but also ischemia in order to randomize patients in this trial. Because now, like I'll tell you, after uh, revivesis, I had a, a case of a patient uh, that had viability on MRI, um, was 40 years old, so definitely not the population uh, that was uh, enrolled in BSIS-2 because this patient under any other circumstances would have undergone bypass. Uh, and then we did a PET viability that showed a significant amount of mismatch. So I'm not sure that the results of Revive apply to that patient, even though he may be relatively asymptomatic. Uh, so I think ischemia testing is uh, very important. Uh, and whether, you know, hibernating myocardium is a thing or not a thing, that's a, a very heated debate uh, with uh, Revive VSYS2. So that was a long-winded answer. <laughs> Yeah. 
it made me want to puke too. Uh, and it's it's hard to puke when you're wearing a face mask and scrub. Yeah, because you contaminate the sterile. Yep. That was a joke, by the way. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so that's that's uh, like a, a very interesting question um, and almost a philosophical question. So I'll give you an example. Um, la just this last Friday, I was actually thinking about that same question for this presentation. I was in the cath lab uh, and I, uh, I saw a patient that I had stented in 2020. I had done PCI of the RCA. Uh, and at that point in time, he had a diagonal uh, uh, stenosis, like osteodiagonal, uh, in an LED that wasn't significantly narrow. So at that point in time, I said, if your symptoms uh, disappear, uh, we don't necessarily need to address the diagonal because addressing the diagonal will also require an intervention in the LED because you don't want to compromise uh, the integrity of the LED being the larger vessel. Um, he comes back again with symptom. Uh, this patient's a physician, so he can tell me what angina uh, feels like. And he says that this is impacting his quality of life. Um, you know, he tells me that he likes to travel, uh, that he likes fishing, um, and that now when he goes fishing, he takes, you know, a satellite phone uh, because having uh, angina in the middle of nowhere is scary. Uh, most people, unfortunately, cannot afford a satellite phone to go fishing. Um, so while he's on the table, uh, before I even look at the coronary anatomy, I ask him, uh, I'm doing this presentation. Uh, and I have a question for you. Uh, if you had to choose between living the, and by the way, he's unoptimized uh, medical therapy. He couldn't tolerate beta blockers. Uh, he was on high doses of calcium channel blockers. Uh, sublingual nitroglycerin gave him a strong headache. The one thing he had not tried uh, was uh, uh, essentially a nitro patch. Uh, and again, I don't know what it's like to, like one of the things that I think skews uh, the equation is that most physicians and most interventional cardiologists don't have angina. At least, uh, you know, that's uh, an assumption that I make. Uh, and those that do, um, those that do uh, probably don't live necessarily with angina. I would say that maybe the majority or I don't know what percentage. So if I don't know what it's like to live a life with angina, who am I to say, you know, the risk uh, benefit equation? So I asked this uh, patient uh, on the table, I asked him if I were to tell you that you had to live the rest of your life like this, or that there was a procedure that could potentially help uh, reduce your symptoms, what sort of risk or mortality uh, would you take? You know, would you want it to be less than 0.001% or does the angina bother you uh, so much that you would be able to take a risk of mortality of 1%, let's say, you know, like, uh, and who decides that? Because that's a value-based judgment. So whenever I speak to patients, I try to understand the complexity of the procedure. Uh, I tell them up front uh, the risk, and now I have a chip uh, score that I can use to give them a better uh, quantitative indication of what the risks uh, could be. Uh, and I, of course, make sure that the patient's symptomatic uh, and that I think the symptoms are related to coronary artery disease and that the symptoms are related to coronary artery disease related to the target vessel. And that's why uh, ischemia uh, is relevant, right? Because if you're revascularizing myocardium that is not viable uh, uh, or viable but not ischemic, then maybe you're exposing the patient to risks. And when it comes to CTO, there is no randomized control trial suggesting an improvement in heart outcomes. It's all about symptoms. And that is uh, value-based, that is patient-specific. So. I have that discussion. And uh, one thing that I have to add is uh, if a patient tells you that their risk uh, threshold uh, is, let's say, uh, hypothetically, as a thought experiment, uh, a patient tells you that their risk uh, threshold is 3%, I would accept 3% uh, risk of a major adverse cardiovascular event. Let's say their CHIP score is 4. The CHIP score is a score that you have before you undertake a procedure. But once you start the procedure, you know that the CHIP score is probably not reflective of your patient, right? Uh, the CHIP score doesn't say whether you have an epicardial collateral, uh, probably uh, because that's not necessarily something that's common enough that would make into a large uh, uh, database, right? So as the risk goes up, 
uh, during a procedure, I feel that most interventionalists uh, that do chip procedures have understood that maybe you need to take a step back, uh, fail uh, in the procedure, uh, and then essentially bring the patient back and discuss. One of the things I want to say is uh, voluntary reporting of uh, adverse events leads you to avoid uh, uh, performing procedures on high risk uh, patients. Now the opposite can be true. So there's uh, open uh, CTO, there's a number of CTO registries that actually show success rates. And interventionalists take a lot of pride in having success rates that are above 95%. In fact, they quote them to patients when they come in. Uh, that in itself, just like an adverse reporting registry can be problematic because if you're trying to keep your uh, success rates above 95% at the expense of the patient, potentially at the expense of risks, like ultimately you can't lose focus that this is all about the patient, right? It's not about success rate. It's not about a registry. It's about the patient on the table. Uh, so I, I feel that, uh, I'll, I'll give you one more example. Um, uh, uh, there was a patient that had uh, essentially a flush occlusion of the RCA uh, done at, uh, uh, referred to my center. Uh, the patient uh, only had an occlusion of the RCA and had multiple comorbidities that pro uh, precluded her from having a bypass, which again, most people wouldn't consider bypass just for the RCA. Uh, there was no way to assess uh, this uh, vessel through an integrated approach. And there was actually a CT, uh, cardiac CT that showed a massive chunk of calcium uh, uh, in the ostium of the RCA. Uh, but because the patient was symptomatic, we decided to uh, take on the approach. Uh, we went through a retrograde approach. The septal laterals didn't seem particularly viable. Um, uh, but ultimately, by blind surfing, we were able to get into the distal RCA and ultimately get a microcatheter uh, into the ostium of the RCA. So we're about two millimeters from the aorta. Like that's all we needed. Uh, and we tried uh, Confianza Pro 12, uh, you know, after trying Gaia 3, we didn't have a stata at that point in time. Um, and um, uh, the next step uh, in escalation uh, would essentially be cauterization. So to grab the back of a, of a guide wire uh, and cauterize it to use the electricity to essentially drill through the calcium. Uh, now, that procedure uh, is a procedure that can be successful, but it's associated with higher risks. Uh, it's a procedure that uh, I had never done, uh, and is a procedure that I was uh, unwilling to do at that point in time, unless I was proctored on how to do it. Because uh, even in the best hands, uh, the complication rates are high enough. So that's a situation in which I said, can this, is this procedure indicated? Perhaps. Can this procedure be done safely? Probably. Can it be done safely by me? No. And then at that point, we just stopped the procedure. And then if the patient was truly symptomatic, then I would either uh, be proctored for the procedure by somebody who has done it before or refer the patient to another center to have the procedure if it was believed to be indicated. So I feel you like it's really important to recognize um, what you're able to do and what you're not able to do. You know, that year at Columbia, didn't make me an expert chip operator. I think it's a lifelong uh, process. And as you navigate through that lifelong process, you have to be careful and always uh, make sure that you keep the patient uh, uh, in mind. Oh, sorry, any, yeah. Um, I don't see anything, no. Well, we're, 